Materials supplied by Microsoft Corporation may be used for internal review, analysis, or research only. Any editing, reproduction, publication, rebroadcast, public showing, internet or public display is forbidden and may violate copyright law. Hey. Hello everyone. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Pan Wei Ko from Stanford University. He is uh, working on his PhD with Chris India. And, uh, over the summer, you're working with Stephanie Kohler and Kaliko, mm -hmm. and he is visiting Cambridge for this week. So we're very fortunate to have him give lecture for us. Great. Please start. Thank you for hosting me, and thanks for coming. OK, so this talk is um, going to be about how a simple, decades-old idea from statistics can help us interpret today's black box models. OK. so. In recent years, there's been an explosion of interest in, in machine learning, as I'm, you know, all of you are aware. And I heard talk of convolutions and queue learning and so on just now. So this explosion has been driven uh, you know, in, in part by the gains in accuracy that machine learning models have made in a lot of different tasks, uh, like object recognition, so famously. It's so much so that on many real-world tasks, uh, machine learning models have performance that are now comparable or better than, than what humans can do. However, while we've gotten better at making high-performing models, it's still hard to understand sort of fundamentally why, why do these models work? Right? What are they doing? And this is because well, the models are not exactly simple. Right? They can have thousands, if not millions, of parameters. Uh, you recognize this from ImageNet, and uh, AlexNet, rather. And there's been a lot of you know, we're, we're, there's been a lot of work on explicitly interpretable models, including uh, great work from Microsoft. Uh, but by and large, they haven't matched the performance of these sort of black box models where you, you don't explicitly care about interpretability. And so why are these sort of complicated models behaving the way they, they do? Um, why are they making the predictions they make? That's going to be the focus of this talk. So the central question is, uh, given a high accuracy black box model, and the prediction that this model makes, can we answer, well, why did the model make this prediction? For some definition of why. Okay? And we are interested in this because you know, beyond just getting high accuracy, if we can understand why the model made a prediction, uh, we can make better decisions. We can examine the model's reasoning to see if it's faulty. Uh, we can understand different failure modes of the model so, so we can improve it. Uh, you know, you can discover new science or principles about the world. And also, you can just provide explanations to end users, which will be increasingly important as ML systems get deployed more and more in the real world. And I'm sure you're familiar with the new EU regulations around the right to an explanation and so on. Okay. Oh, and, and by the way, just feel free to, to ask any questions halfway if you have them. Okay, so, so that's the setup. Right? Just to ground us in a concrete example, uh, let's say we have this, this image, right? That's a dog, this is a, the raw input, and then it goes through your favorite model, some neural net or whatever, uh, and then it, 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 the model comes out with this label dog, okay? So what do we want to do? We want to try to understand, like, why did the model say this is a dog? Can, can we explain you know, the reasoning that the model did? Okay, so of course this is not a new question. Uh, there's been... The, the hardest part of the question is really just defining you know, what is why. And there's been a lot of great work on this spanning many, many years. So here's a sampling of what people have done. Right? What, what kinds of questions have people studied? You know, um, what kind of inputs maximally activate different neurons? You know, do you have like an edge neuron or a corner or a dog face neuron or something? Right? Can we represent these models with simpler models that might be easier to understand? Can we look at which parts of the input, when occluded, maybe change the prediction the most. And so there's been a lot of good work on this. And these methods have led to useful insights um, and understanding and improvements in models. Right? But there's still something missing among uh, many of these methods. And, and the one common thread is that they all treat the learned model, like this thing in the middle, as something that's fixed. Okay? And they try to give explanations in terms of this fixed model. Right. But sometimes you, you want to understand well, the provenance of the model. Where, where did the model come from? Why did it learn the way it's learned? Right. And 
the, so the question is, well, where do these par parameters of the model come from? And the answer is that ultimately it all comes from the training data. Right? So the picture in the previous slide was a bit incomplete. Right? It was just on the right hand side. But actually you have all this training. We didn't sort of write down the weights by hand. Right? The weights were learned from the training data and then the prediction on the test input is actually a function of the training data. Okay, so this leads to the question which we will be trying to answer in this talk. Well, can we give an explanation of a prediction in terms of the training data? Uh, do you have a question? Oh, okay. so, so this is uh, the central point of our work, so let me just repeat it. Um, so most existing methods would uh, treat the model as, as something that's already learned, right? whereas we treat the model as a function of the training data. And so whereas they can explain the prediction with respect to certain model parameters, like the model made this prediction because the coefficient on this feature is high, or they, and they can ex explain the prediction in terms of you know, the test input, like which region is important. What we, we try to do is explain predict the prediction with respect to the training data that was sort of most responsible for a given prediction. Okay. So what does it mean for a, a tra the training data to be responsible or not for a given prediction? Uh, what, what we're going to do is to take our training examples and one by one we are going to upweight them, so try to make them a bit more important so that the model tries harder to fit that particular training point. And then we're going to see what effect this has on the prediction. Okay, so for example, given this, uh, given this model, if we make this training Im image slightly more important to the model, so the model tries harder to fit it, and we'll, we'll formalize this later, uh, but this is the basic intuition, uh, then you know, if the prediction changes a lot, let's say the model becomes a lot more confident that that is in fact the dog, then we can say that this example has high influence. And if the model sort of totally doesn't care about whether this image is there or not, then that image has low influence on the prediction. Right? Yeah? Why is the right notion of what input, what training data is important, the kind of marginal effect of a particular data point? Yeah, that's a good question. So, so I guess you, you can have different... Are, are you getting at like, you know, different data points interact with each other? Uh, your definition is right. Take all mm -hmm. of the data and think about the additional effect on top of that of this kind of one extra of this one data point of upweighting, right? Yeah. You could even certainly think of other other ways of defining, you know, rather than looking at some sort of average or you know various other ways than just looking mm -hmm. at the, the yeah. margin. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Um, you you can. So I don't think this is like a uniquely correct way of doing it. But it's, it's, it's one intuitive way. And basically what we are trying to, to answer is a, a counterfactual of like, you know, if we didn't have this training image, or if we had many copies of this training image, would the prediction change a lot? And if it does, then you know, in, in some sense, this is important. Right? If, we, if you, know, you change the weight on this image and nothing happened to the prediction, then probably the model is not making use of that image. Mm -hmm. And so sort of conveniently, this is also computationally tractable. Okay, so, so this gives us sort of an instance-specific explanation of a, of a particular prediction in terms of the training data. Yeah? Just quickly, what, what do you, in what sense is it computationally tractable? Do you mean you just, you just uh, wait, so you take a trained model and then you, you, you take each image and invert, essentially invert the last step to sort of remove the influence of that? Yeah, so it's not obvious that it's tractable yet, but I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. Uh -huh. Okay, so it, you know, basically you can very loosely see this as sort of finding the support vectors right, of, of any, for any given test example in a general model that's not necessarily a, an SVM. Right? Uh, okay, and so by, by going to the training data, instead of, sort of analyzing the weights directly, this just gives us a different perspective on what the model is doing, and we'll make this sort of clearer in the subsequent slides. Okay, so just to recap where we are, we start off with quite, you know, this general question of why did the model make this prediction? And then we note that while well, the model ultimately comes from the training data, so can we ask well, what, which training points were most responsible for this prediction? And we try to formalize this by asking the counterfactual, well, how would the prediction change if we up or down weighted each, each training point? Okay. Okay, so how do you actually do this? 
Right, so that, that, that leads us to the next part, um, which, which is the use of influence functions to answer the question, that question. Okay, so let's formalize all of this. Uh, let's assume that we have training data we, and label it so Z1, Z2, uh, all the way to Zn, where each Z is a pair of X and Y. Right? So X would be the images for in this example, and Y is the label. Okay? So this is our standard empirical risk minimization. You, you, you pick the model parameters theta hat, uh, and you, you pick them so that you minimize some sort of average loss uh, over all your training examples, right? For whatever v loss you, you want, um, and and for now we assume that the loss is of a nice convex differentiable loss, okay? Okay, so so that's a standard setup. Right now, assume you have one particular training image that you you want to change the weight of, right? Call that z. Uh, you we want to so make that a little bit more important and see what happens to the model. So the way you can we formalize this is by slightly changing the loss function. So we have this term, which, which was there before, and then we add in a little epsilon times the loss on that particular image right? for, for some small value of epsilon. You can sort of see this as changing the training distribution. Okay, so the, the empirical training distribution is a probability distribution that assigns 1 over n mass to each training point. And here we're just uh, reweighting it a little bit so that's sort of epsilon more probability mass on this chain example that we want to upward. Okay? So this makes the model try a little bit harder to fit that particular chain example Z. Okay? And then we learn new, a new, new set of parameters. We call that theta hat uh, of epsilon and Z. So the parameters you learn if you upweight Z by epsilon. Okay? And so, you know. The model might might change a little bit, right? If for 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 some values of epsilon at least, so you have the original model on the left where maybe the model says, okay, it's a dog with, with such and such a confidence, and after you upweight this particular training example, maybe the prediction changes by a little bit, okay? So then I'll, I'll, we want to measure this change and you know say that examples that produce larger changes are more influential, and so one. The way we can do this is just by measuring the lo the difference in the loss on a particular test example, right? So, you know, given the two prediction, the original prediction and the new prediction after the modification, how does the loss change? Okay, and so if, informally we say that if this change is larger, then the example has higher influence. Okay, so that's the that's the sort of formalized setup. Do you have any any questions so far? Okay. Yeah. Uh, the, the minimized loss with respect to say uh, once you choose the so once you choose the test example you you change the loss from any and what is the, and then you try to minimize that loss with with respect to any theta and then you measure the Yeah, that's right. So you said the, the loss function itself is the same, right? Like whatever, hinge loss or square loss or something. But the, you learn a different set of parameters because you, the parameters are the minimizers of different uh, optimization problems. One is just with the original data, and one is with the uh, slight upweighting of a particular training point. This is a practically useful setting because for the testing, since you may not have the label right here, so if a user wants to use the system and wants an explanation why the system gave that decision, right? If you don't have Z test, you have only X test. Yeah, exactly. that's a good point. So, um, you know, you, so you can use this if you're maybe debugging your model or you know that it made an error. But if you have a, a novel input, uh, so then you, you can't use this. But it's, like, it's, it's easy to just... We, we be, it's easy to look at basically any function of the old and new parameters. So you can see sort of maybe how much does the prediction change without any notion of the loss. So you take this as expectation over the label as predicted by the model. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You said exactly. at the beginning this is very specifically to look at the influence of the training data. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, you know, I said it was tractable earlier, but actually, if you sort of naively, the thing you would, you might try is to you know, fix the value of epsilon and try retraining the model for every different z, 
right, and, and see how the parameters change. But that is very slow, especially if you have these large models that take a long time to train. Um, so happily, it turns out that there's actually a closed form expression that for very small epsilon allows us to solve this exactly without needing to retrain the model. And so for that, we turn to influence functions, which is a, which are a very old idea from statistics uh, introduced several decades ago, as with, I guess, a lot of things in machine learning. Uh, so influence is a, it's a measure of stability, right? And um, statisticians in the past, and the few of robust statistics, were interested in finding estimators that didn't change too much with the underlying data, so that they wouldn't be vulnerable to outliers. Right. So basically, the, if you have some sort of estimator that takes in a distribution, uh, they were interested in asking, well, how much does this estimator change if we make a small perturbation to the distribution? Right. So for example, your estimator could be the mean of some, some distribution of values, and you know, you want to know, well, if I changed one of these values, how much does the mean change? Okay, so um, there's been quite a lot of work on 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 this over over the years, and we are using just sort of the very basic formulas. Um, but for and for us, t is basically the loss on the test input, and f is our empirical training distribution. And so, just to to get this down in equations, um, this was the the definition of the parameters that we had after modification. Sorry, that's actually a, uh, an extra 1 minus epsilon term there that we didn't have in the previous slide. And this bas bas th these are the formulas for the influence function. So let me, let's just pass this slowly. Right. So we assume that L, which is the loss function, has, is nice and regular for now. And we will see how to relax this later. Um, so if the loss is differentiable and convex, then the influence of upweighting a training point z on the loss on the test example z test right, we, is defined as you know as how much the loss changes on this test point as we increase epsilon by a, a little bit. And epsilon remember is the amount that we upweight the training point z by. So this is sort of a infinitesimal upweighting of the point z. And uh, you can derive a formula for this, which is the gradient of the loss at the test point and the gradient of the loss at the training point uh, in some quadratic form with this inverse of the Hessian matrix, where H is, is the empirical Hessian over all the training points. Okay, so. Uh, the, 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 the derivation is not too difficult. And you can, um, it's basically taking a quadratic Taylor expansion of the loss. And just as a sanity check, right? So this, this is like the, the densest slide in presentation, so you can dwell on this a bit. As a sanity check, if your gradient here is very large, then it means that if I change the, the parameters by a little bit, I can reduce the loss on my training example by quite a lot. Right, that's the sort of definition of a large gradient. So if the and that means that if I upweight that training point, my parameters would want to change quite a lot, right? Because I want to reduce the loss on that training point, and so the influence of that training point will be higher. Okay. But uh, if we assume that this is tractable, the Hessian won't be tractable to compute for a very large model, right? Yeah, the Hessian is not tractable. So this actually is is not yet in, in a particularly tractable form. It is closed form, which I guess is arguably better, but it's not easy to compute yet. And we'll see how to do this faster. Yeah, but good question. Okay, so, yeah. So there's nothing, there's nothing that requires theta hat to actually be the, the optimum here, right? This, uh, this, this calculation of the, of the derivative will work for any, any theta. So you can work out the influence of a, of a training set at any, at any point, not necessarily the global optimum. Yeah, that's right. But uh, this, the equation would change a little bit. So this, this, this particular one assumes that the gradient at theta hat is 0. Uh, it, it doesn't actually have to be a global minimum. Yeah. And if it's not 0, then you have to add in some term for the whatever residual gradient you have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And because the gradient is 0, by assumption here, uh, because data is a, is a uh, ERM, 
then you don't have a linear term. So when you do a quadratic Taylor expansion, all you get is this Hessian term. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the intuition for the Hessian is it basically sort of captures how much the other data points want to stay at the value of data head that you that you found, right? Um, so if so, so this term is how much the model wants to try to fit the, the upweighted training point, and this term is how much everything else like wants to stay at the, the previous value of the parameter that you found. Okay, and you can also see this as a sort of similarity metric, and this is um, basically the sort of Fisher uh, metric as well. If you're familiar with that. Okay, so so before we go on to actually how to try to compute it. Um, we, let's, I'll show you a slide on you know, how do different models look and their influences look like. All right? So using, using the previous equation, uh, we just tested uh, two different models of image recognition just to see you know, how their influence might change. Right? So we took a, this is a sort of binary classification task where we're trying to do, sort of recognize whether this is a fish or not. Um, so this is a particular test image, and we compared two different models. One is a SVM with a radial basis function kernel, and the other is basically logistic regression on top of an uh, inception network. Okay, uh, and where where we fix the inception network and just train the top layer. Okay, so this both of these models actually correctly predict that in fact the test image is a fish. Uh, but the way they do it is quite different. So as expected, perhaps, in the SVM, it, th these are the most influential examples in a positive direction on the test image for each model. And you can see that you know, the SVM with the RBF basically does a soft nearest neighbor classification. And it's run on pixel space, so it finds training images that are very close to the test image in pixel space, and those are influential. Uh, this is just a, a graph that shows that. Whereas uh, the neural net, through some magic of neural nets, finds uh, things, finds sort of semantically similar training images. So you can see this, these two fish actually have quite different backgrounds and are quite far away in pixel space from the test image, uh, but uh, they are nonetheless the most influential training images on this test image. Different, right? You said on the top it's pixel representation, on the bottom it's the inception feature vector. Yeah, exactly. But you could, you could back cross through the inception net as well, right? So would that change the influences that you would get out? Uh, no. Uh, in, in this case, it's the, the inf it's just, you know, if I upweight or downweight a particular training image, like would, uh, what would happen to the prediction? So. Wait, but um, if I understand correctly, So you ignore the parameter geometry and the influence that the data sample could have on the, on the change of these parameters on the inception network. Oh, oh, I see. Yeah, that's right. So, so yeah, if, if you allow the whole network to change, then your influence will be different. Sorry, yeah, totally right. Um, but, it, but I don't think it would significantly change, change this uh, sort of qualitative observation that it, it looks more like the basically that the models get the same thing cor correct, but they seem to approach it from quite different ways, in that the most helpful training examples that the model is relying on to make this prediction are quite different. And then sort of, yeah. Sorry. yeah. Have you compared to taking the nearest neighbor in the future space? Yeah, uh, so we have, I don't have the slides here, but it, it is actually quite different um, from taking the, the nearest neighbor in feature space as well. Um, because the so so if you just take the nearest neighbor in feature space, uh, basically you are taking this term minus the the Hessian in the middle, yeah, and that that actually has, can have quite a large difference. Um, also, in this form, uh, training examples with higher loss uh, have higher influence because the model tries harder to fit fit the examples with higher loss. Um, so I guess the combination of both of these things actually make the nearest neighbor distance quite different from the influence in some cases. So to, to just to, to understand correctly, the Hessian matrix in the example you showed, 
it's just taking into account the last layer. Exactly. So, you know, it's just a linear model. That's right. That yes. Uh -huh. So it's more comparison not between SVM and, and, and neural networks, it's more like fixed representation versus some high level feature encoding that comes out of a neural network. But you could apply logistic regression as well uh, on. on the exactly. Network. And logistic regression will, will look something like this. Mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, yeah, so this is you know, a, a sort of kernel features based on the pixels, and these are kernel features based on something that neural nets do. Right? Uh, and and as another interesting difference is that we, we found these, these sort of weird examples where there's, there's some. So actually, let me back up a bit. This was a classification task where half the images were fish and half the images were dogs. And we we're like, can you tell which one's a fish and dog? Not the world's hardest task. Uh, and we found some, some images of dogs that would look so different from this test image that their presence actually helped the, the neural net do the correct classification. Uh, whereas you, we didn't really find this in the, in the SVM train on the pixels um, because you know, this is more of a nearest neighbor thing and these two things are so far away that they have basically zero influence in the uh, RBF case. But then in the neural nets case, they are so different that um, the presence of this dog actually is quite helpful for the model. Uh, that's a random observation there. Sorry, again, um, how is the distribution of the influence value different from SEM to neural Yeah, so you can see, see it on the left. Uh, so here is the plot of each dot as a training example. The green ones are fishes and the red ones are dogs. And the y-axis is the influence and the x-axis is just the Euclidean distance in pixel space. So you can see that for the RBF, it, it kind of matches what you would expect. Uh, as the images are further apart from each other, the influence decreases in, in both directions. Uh, and influence is a sign quantity, right? It can either be super influential and helpful or super influential and, and bad for the prediction. Uh, whereas the, in the inception case, it, it has much less correlation with distance. I was wondering, like, is which one look more peaky in the sense that it's, the prediction is supported by a small number of training examples versus mm. large number of examples combined together? Yeah, great, great question. Uh, it's not obvious. So, so just by. We can't really tell. Yeah. yeah. It's hard to tell. I mean, there are, in this case, there are a few that are, in, that are much higher than the rest. But just in terms of uh, the pure magnitude, uh, the, if you compare the scales, the influence on the uh, SVM is much higher. Like if you put one that's uh, very close to it in pixel space, just because of how the RBF works, that could change your prediction by a lot. Check a different distance metric. For example, did you look at some like half feature transform that's more because this looks like it's it's learned some patterns, right? Mm -hmm. Because this image and that image they have they have very large similarity in the patterns you see. Did you observe anything like that? Uh, good question. Now I didn't try it, but I would expect that that basically the influence will, it ought to pick up whatever your features are actually measuring, right? So if you if you use some some features that measure the presence of say particular edges and orientations, then the most influential training examples ought to be the ones that maybe share that same pattern with the training image. Right? So, so in this case, it was just L2 distance and pixel space. So you find training images that are very close to the test image in L2 distance. In this case, not sure what it's doing, but it seems to be looking at the, you know, the patterns on the fish themselves as opposed to the background. And so you find training images that are quite similar in that respect. The inception um, model with like other neural network models as well. Uh, nope, uh, we haven't tried changing the weights, but uh, no, like other architectures. Oh yeah, no, we haven't compared other, other other architectures, but I would expect they do pretty similar things. Um, are those uh, are the influences comparable? If uh, so you use the different losses that for the for the SVM and for the logistic version. Yeah, good question. So they are, they are comparable to the extent that the hinge looks kind of like the logistic loss function, but, but not directly. Yeah. Uh, they, they shouldn't by themselves though result in like a two order of magnitude change. So I think that is actually something different. Okay. 
So, um, okay, so, so that's the sort of basic influence function work. Um, and so far we've seen you know, how to define these things and how to compute them in theory uh, by inverting the Hessian. But, you know, in the origin, as, as you've alluded to earlier, in the original paper in the 70s, well, n was 24 and you know, 10, 10 dimensional vectors. And they had half of the paper was like, let's look at training example one, let's look at training example two, and so on. Right? Because data sets used to be much smaller. So how do we try to scale up these methods to, to so a more modern settings where you have tons of data and the data points are very high dimensional? Right? So there are several problems. Uh, and one, as we say, just the efficiency of you know, doing these hash inverses and so on. Two is, well, you know, SVM has hinge loss. That sort of contradicts what we said about the loss being nice and smooth. So how do we deal with that? And the third is, is uh, what you said earlier, where you know, sometimes you just can't find a global optimum, especially in a, in a neural net. So does anything we said actually hold still? OK, so I'll go through this quickly, uh, just so I can get to the applications. Um, the details are all uh, in our paper and in the references. but. Let's, let's go through this briefly. So this is what you had seen previously. This is the formula for, that we want to compute. And the key idea here is that, well, this Hessian inverse is really expensive. Right? It's sort of cubic in the um, dimension of, the, of each feature, and that can be quite bad. So what we want to do is try to not form it explicitly. Right? Instead, we note that you, know, you don't have to form the whole matrix, you just need to be able to take the product of this inverse matrix with some other vector, right? uh, in particular the gradient of the loss. And it turns out that you can do this, uh, for, you can do this quickly without needing to form the whole matrix, right? As, um, especially if you're only looking at a few different vectors. Um, and so what we do is, well, we have this vector, right, which is the gradient of the loss, and then we use um, some sort of linear algebra tricks to compute the Hessian vector product uh, without actually forming the Hessian. And you can do this in basically linear time, even though this is a, a matrix vector multiplication. And then we, once you have this Hessian vector product, you can use it to get the inverse Hessian vector product uh, by some other optimization tricks. Um, such as sort of posing this as a solution to, of the, for, to a quadratic problem and solving it with CG or something like that. And these are all um, sort of standard uh, tricks in, in, in the optimization literature, especially from second order optimization, where you know, you, people for a long time have tried to figure out how do I incorporate second order Hessian information into my gradient steps. Uh, so we, we didn't do anything sort of particularly New here, we adapted a lot of techniques that were already in the field. Yeah. You said it's linear time, but conjugate gradients convergence is not linear time, right? Uh, so sorry, that I was just talking about the the first step. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. But but in 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 general, uh, so so you're right. Um, and for the larger scale experiments, we actually use a different method that's in the, this third paper here, which is a stochastic estimator for the Hessian, and sort of roughly, it seems like you can get fairly good estimates of the accuracy, uh, fairly accurate estimates of the inverse Hessian um, vector product uh, in time that is linear in N and in P. Yeah. So when people compute Fisher kernels, they often just replace the Hessian with a diagonal, and they, you know, asymptotics, you know, MLP <laughs> distribution will uh -huh. be normal with identity, and right then, and it somehow still works amazingly. Did you try yeah. just ignoring it and just use the identity as well, and how would it work? Yeah, so, so if you ignore it, it does, um, it does work better than just, re well, the diagonal version works better than just the identity, for sure. Uh, um, but we, we actually have it in our, it's, it's the first figure in our paper, I think. Um, there are cases in which it actually doesn't capture quite a lot of the information. And it, it, it depends, as you would expect, on how correlated are your features to start with, and so on. Yeah. Okay. Um, so happy to take questions on this, this data as well, but I'll uh, move on. Um, okay, so what if the derivatives of the laws don't exist? Um, which is basically true for anything we might want to study. Um, so we, we ran an experiment where we tried 
for each training point, we remove the training point and we actually retrain the model. We just like ran the code again. Um, and then we compare the, what we compare the parameters we got we got there with what we estimated would happen if we use influence functions. Right? And um, basically for the hinge loss, like there was very little correlation. You can see on the axis axis the actual difference in the loss of on a particular training point that you get while retraining. And on the y axis is our predicted thing, which was not very good at predicting it. Uh, and this is because at the hinge, uh, the, the, we set a derivative to zero, which is quite a bad approximation of what's actually happening. Right? And moreover, in an SVM, like, it tries to push things to the hinge. So it's not just a sort of pathological point. So the key idea here is, well, we can actually just try to replace this loss function that is not smooth with a smooth version. Um, so uh, this is like a sort of soft hinge, somewhat like the logistic loss. And you can see that it, you know, for different values of t, which is a temperature term, uh, you can get curves that look arbitrarily close to the hinge, uh, but they are still smooth. Um, and if you do this, by, you know, if you set t to some appropriately low value, you actually get pretty good predictions out of it. And uh, this is this is the predict predicted difference in the loss when you're using the smooth. Uh, version of the hinge, but the actual difference in loss is actually with the real hinge. Right? So basically, you can train a model using the non-differentiable version of the loss, and just for the purposes of calculating influence, you can swap in some sort of uh, smoother thing that has some second-order information, and it sh at least in this case, it should do pretty well. Okay, uh, and finally, you know. Our analysis relied on finding the actual global optimum, uh, which, at least that's what we assumed earlier. This is hard to do in general because of non-convexity, early stopping, poor optimization, whatever. And so what happens if you don't find the global optimum? Um, and basically, as, as we discussed earlier, well, if you can, can get reasonably close to a local minimum, okay, for, for some definition of reasonably, then the analysis uh, still holds, and it, it is as if you started at that local minimum, and you re then you remove, you, you upweighted a point, and you retrain the model starting from that local minimum. Right, so inf the influence function basically tells you what happens if you initialize the model at the local minimum and then retrain it. Right, and um, the more details are in our paper as well, um, but this, this is the sort of intuitive idea. So it doesn't it doesn't tell you, you know, if, if you have a cost landscape that has lots of different local minima, the influence function doesn't tell you what happens if you randomly restarted your model somewhere else and retrained it, but it tells you what happens if you start from the same local minimum. And in some sense, given that this is sort of an asymptotic technique, uh, that's like the best we can hope for. Okay. So what if you end up in a very flat minimum where the Hessian disappears? Yeah, so, that, so uh, you, you have problems if you are in a super flat place or even if you are like on a settle point. You know, if you don't actually reach the a local minimum, your Hessian might have negative eigenvalues. Uh, and then... it's sufficiently curved, I think your measure would work. Yeah, exactly. Would be a problem when you invert Yeah, so flatness is a big problem. Um, what we found is that we just, you, can, you can add quadratic regularization and... and and, and make it curved, and actually it seems to, to work okay. So, um, so we did the same experiment where we removed stuff and then retrained the model and compared it to the predictions using influence. Uh, on the left, uh, just softmax, so uh, it's a linear model, things work well. On the right, we use a, a, a convolutional net, I think there was seven layers or something. Um, and we, we tried to backprop through the entire thing, so that's uh, non-convex, uh, and we didn't train it to convergence, so we stopped the optimization early. And we found that we still could do reasonably well. It's not as nice because of all these assumptions and because of the regularization we added and so on, but it still um, actually finds the most influential points quite reliably. Yeah? So in, in that model, how many parameters did you have? Uh, good question. Not, 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 not that many. I think just a few thousand for this but example. Yeah. 
hundreds or thousands by thousands. Uh, oh yeah, so, so we, we used the, the methods that we, I, I just skimmed through earlier to do that quickly. Um, but we had to use a pretty small model because to get the ground truth, we needed to retrain the model for each training point that we removed. So that was much slower than computing the influence. Yeah. Okay, so now let, let me get through the applications in the last 50 minutes. So uh, we have, so we have seen how to, uh, at least if you, if you believe me, we have seen how to use influence, calculate influence like fairly efficiently and actually use it on some real world models. So what good does this do? Right? What can we use influence functions for? So I'll go through three different examples. Uh, one is to just debug errors in the model. Two is to try to fix noisy tra or mislabeled training data. And the third is uh, some sort of adversarial training. Okay, so let's go through this in turn. All right, so number one, if a model, if you know a model makes a mistake, okay, let's say you have some validation set and you see that a model is wrong, can we find out why? Okay, so for a case study, we, we took a hospital readmission data set from UCI uh, that basically given a bunch of features on a patient, try, can you predict whether the patient will end up back in hospital in the next 30 days? Right? And, and um, uh, then this is this is useful because you know if you if you can if you know that a patient has a high chance of getting back in the hospital, you might want to give more intensive care or check out on the patient and so on, right? So, using this data set, we set up a do we so sort of purposely set up a domain mismatch so that the model would make an error and so that we would know what the the reason for this error, right? and we wanted to see if we could use influence functions to try to you know find that error that we introduced. Okay, so the, the data set comprised you know, some set of healthy and, and soon to be not healthy adults and, and the same for children. And originally, well, it had about 20,000 adults and a small number of kids uh, below the age of 10. And we basically just modified the data set by removing most of the healthy kids. And so we set up, a, we introduced an artificial domain mismatch here where um, the model now thinks that kids are very likely to be readmitted, whereas this is sort of not true in general. And we want to see whether we can find this out um, if we are given this data without knowing this has changed. And sort of things like do these kinds of domain adaptation problems are actually quite common uh, in, in medicine where you know, uh, hospitals might serve different populations and a model trained on one might not generalize to another. Okay. So the model now sort of wrongly thinks that children get readmitted frequently. Right? So we, we gave it a, a test example of a kid that, that in reality was healthy after 30 days, and the model thinks of oh, this kid is definitely going back to hospital. So um, one baseline that we looked at was just, well, what are the feature weights in our logistic regression? Right? Can we see whether uh, being a kid has a, just a really high coefficient? And so if you eyeball it, you, you, might, you might be able to diagnose what's wrong. Um, and it turns out that oh, it doesn't really pop out. If you look at the different weights for the features, um, the indicator for being a kid is somewhere here. It's relatively high, but it's not sort of immediately obvious that this is why the model is making a mistake. Right? Um, however, if you look at the <coughs> which training examples are influential on, on our test <coughs> prediction, um, we see that basically it's, there are four, remember there are four children left in the data set and they have sort of vastly higher influences than any, any other training point in the data set. Right? So basically the four children left in the data set are the ones that are making the model get us wrong. Right, so if you remember in this slide, you know, we are left with three sick kids and one healthy one. And uh, that basically corresponds to this. The, the, the sort of re-emitted children are the, uh, causing the model to get this test prediction wrong. Yeah. So, so looking at this, it's not clear to me how you get to the next step in your claim. Right? I look at this and I say, okay, oh, well, these, these are the four examples that it's basing this on. And yes, somehow it matched it to these four children and mm -hmm. three of them were unhealthy, so of course it made, made the wrong decision. Mm -hmm. How do you get from that to the realization that actually these are the only four children in the data set? Yeah, uh, good question. So we looked at, um, the, next, well, the next step is looking at the, sort of the gradient of the influence with respect to the features. So which of these features of the, the, tra of the influential training points were responsible for its high influence? And you can see that in this case, the 
So our indicator variable for being a kid actually stands out. Um, so in that sense, you can, you can make a guess as to, oh, it's probably because they're children. Mm -hmm. Yeah? So can I ask a quick, a quick question about what exactly you're testing? You're looking at, you're looking at the classification of a particular, um, of a particular input at test time, and then looking at the, the influence of um, all the training data on the classification of that mm -hmm. exactly. in test input. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And you just chose that test input arbitrarily, did you? Uh, yes, well, we well, chose... just found one that was misclassified and then... Yeah, we, we ran the original model and the, the new model after we removed a bunch of healthy kids and we just found one that, that the model got wrong. Yeah, yeah. Ah, right. yeah because we, we, want, we wanted to introduce an error that we knew why there was an error so that we could try to find out yeah. the error. Yeah, okay, so that's one. Uh, and so you know, hopefully this will be useful for, for practitioners trying to diagnose what's going on with their models. Uh, the second example that we looked at was uh, on fixing the training data. So, you know, in the real world, training labels are noisy, especially if they are crowdsourced or something. And some, in, in some, sometimes we can actually, if we inspected the training data, we could fix it if we, if we had the time, but you don't generally have time to look through all of your training data, right? So here's a, I'll set up as well, if let's say you have a small budget, where you can actually go and look at some a small fraction of your training data and manually sort of fix them. Right? Can we help to prioritize which ones you might look at? Okay? So uh, we looked at a spam uh, classification example using an Enron data set. So let's say you have a bunch of um, noise of, of labeled emails, whether they are spam or not spam. Right? In, in reality, this is pretty noisy because, you know, it's, it's all user-based and it's even subject to adversarial attack. Um, so what we did, just so we knew the ground truth, was we took 10% of the labels and we just flipped them. Okay, so now we know uh, which labels are sort of wrong, wrongly labeled, well, which examples are wrongly labeled. Okay, and now the key idea here is that, well, if a training point is not influential, then we shouldn't waste our effort to check it. Uh, even if it's wrongly labeled and it's not influential, it doesn't matter. Um, and so, can we instead spend our effort checking the examples that are influential and maybe that will help us use our budget more effectively? Right? And just a, a side technical note that we don't have access to the test set in this case, so you can't measure the loss as you uh, talked about earlier. So instead, we sort of measure some sort of cross-validation version of influence. Okay. And uh, the results are as follows. So on the x-axis is the fraction of the training data that we check. So this is our budget to check. Um, and remember that 10% sort of, of the training data is actually flipped. And the y-axis is the accuracy on the unseen test set that you get uh, if you, after ch checking this amount of training data, fixing the ones that you checked, and then uh, training the model. Okay. And so uh, the dotted line here is what you get if you had totally clean data. Uh, the red line is what you get if you just randomly pick training data to check and you fixed it if, if it made a mistake. Uh, the green line is what you get if you just check the training examples that have the highest loss, so the most wrong ones, um, and you try to fix them. And the blue is if you try to fix the most influential training examples. And so you can see that this is a, at least compared to these baselines, it's a, it's a more effective way of prioritizing you know, which parts of your training data should you look at. And so if your model makes a mistake, maybe you can say, well, you know, maybe it's because the training data is wrong. Let me look at the most influential examples and see if I can find something. Yeah. Um, could it be the case that the kind of influence is asymmetric in the sense that if you've got the wrong label, like a noisy label, then it's not influential. But if the label had been the right label, then yeah. that could have been an influential yeah, point. That's a good point. Um, and that, that is actually, that is true. Um, and uh, you, you want to balance that with the probability of the model. Uh, so like if, if, the, if the training example is very, um, probable to be of a particular label, then you want to weight it by the probability 
So, so basically, you can do like a weighted version of influence where you, you weight it by the class probability and then by the influence if that example had a certain class. Yeah, and then you get, you, you basically, that's, I think, basically what you did. Yeah, good question, good spot. Okay, and just to get to the last example, uh, this is it's a direction that we actually didn't think we would go in, but um, it turns out that influence functions so let us do this. So um, machine learning systems today, well, they obtain a lot of the training data from the outside world, right? And so this makes, it, makes them vulnerable to attack if someone could attack the training data set. Right? So if you assume that you know, uh, you collecting a, you collect, your data set is, is collected from the actions of users, then a malicious user could take particular actions and sort of screw up your data set. Okay, so this is known as a data poisoning attack. It's been studied quite a bit in the literature. And uh, we want to ask, well, can we use influence functions to help create sort of, you know, if we were an attacker, could we create these sort of adversarial malicious training examples to, to poison a data set? Okay, so I'm sure most of you are familiar with, with this image uh, taken from sort of Goodfellow et al. Uh, this is an example of an adversarial test time example. Right, where basically you have a neural net that does image recognition. Uh, it says that this image is a panda with reasonable confidence. If you add a very small amount of noise to this image, carefully chosen, um, you basically can trick the model into thinking that it is a different image. Right? And this, 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 gradient, this noise is very carefully chosen. Basically, uh, they do like gradient descent on this problem. Right? If you, so assume that the classifier is fixed. Now if you look at what I can change in the test input in order to make the prediction the most wrong, right, and I just follow that gradient, you can come out of this noise and it turns out to be quite effective. Right? So this is work, uh, not, not by us, uh, from a few years ago. And our idea is, well, can we use the same approach as in these adversarial test examples, but instead run it on the training data? And so that we can create adversarial or training examples that can poison the classifier we learn. Okay, uh, uh, so the the so the question then is well, can we get the gradient of the training example uh, on the test prediction? Right. So this is uh, formulated a different way as well. How would the loss on a particular test example change if we modify the training point slightly? Right. So X is an image, if we, if we just added some sort of delta noise to this training point, well, how would the test prediction change? And the idea is that we can, well, you can use our influence function machinery to solve this by interpreting it as adding a little bit of weight on this new point and subtracting weight from the old point. Right? So to move an image a little bit, you just add a new copy here and you remove the old one. Okay? And so using influence functions to do that, we can calculate the gradient of the test loss with respect to any the features of any particular training image. Right? And so if we, if, and we can use this to create adversarial training time examples. So the setup is the same you know, dog versus fish classification tasks that we, we chose because it ought to be hard for a model to get these two classes mixed up. Uh, we did the same logistic regression on top of inception features. And for a given training image, what we do is projected gradient descent. So we modified, we, we modified the image a little bit to maximally increase the test loss. And then we project that modified image back onto the set of all images that, sh that share the same 8-bit representation as the, as the original training image. So we basically want to create a visually imperceptible version of the training image that has this adversarial effect. And then we just repeat this like 100 times. Okay, and it turns out that basically a very small perturbation to one training example. So this is a training example, and we make a very small perturbation to it. Uh, it's actually there's a dog and a fish here, so the model is thoroughly confused by this example. Uh, so just making this change out of I think eighteen hundred training examples, if I'm not wrong, um, is enough to basically flip multiple test predictions. Right, so. Just by making a small change, we, we can see that the model gets all of these test images wrong. Uh, and this change was sort of very carefully chosen to make these test predictions wrong, right? because it was following the gradient of the loss of the model on these test images. 
Um, and so this is, this is basically the analog of the adversarial test examples, but in the training space. And it, it leads to interesting questions about well, how, how secure are machine learning systems if you can make very small targeted changes to the training set and sort of significantly screw up your model in, in a way that might be hard to detect. OK. So with the remaining minus one minutes, let me just conclude. Um, we, so we started off with this question, well, why did the model make this prediction? And we chose to explore a, a sort of complementary perspective on this, which is well, which training points were most responsible for a given prediction? And then we formalized that by asking, OK, so how would the prediction change if we upweighted each training point? Right? And then we presented so some methods to borrowing on the statistics literature uh, for how to do this. And the conclusion is that, well, you know, we can better understand the behavior of models by looking at this provenance, right? How was it obtained from the training data? And we showed this in a few examples. Um, and we can do this efficiently with inference functions sort of across different data sets and across sort of a fairly large variety of models. Okay? And the key is to basically differentiate through the training process and to rely on sort of asymptotics, right? infinitesimal changes to the weight of a training example or to the um, features of a training example. And because you're making such small changes, you can do everything in close form and uh, sort of efficiently approximate the influence. Okay. So this, this locality allows us to get the close one expression. There are many open questions, which are, for example, can we get at a more global notion of influence, which goes back to the, the original, the first question of, well, we are looking at a very sort of marginal form of influence, right? Can you ask questions like, how does this whole subset of the training data affect the model? And that, that might be quite hard to do with our techniques because our method assumes that the model doesn't change too much if you just make a small perturbation. So that's, that's still an open question. And there's, in general, much more work to be done on these tools that can let us sort of figure out what an arbitrary black box model is doing. OK, well, thank you very much. Uh, the code um, and sort of reproducible scripts for the experiments in our paper are uploaded online. This is our paper. Um, so please feel free to refer to those if you want more details. And I'm happy to take questions offline. Thank you.